Hello students. Uh, here it is Thursday, um, March the 26th, and I am going to be reading to you from pages 199. We're going to go clear through until page 219. And uh, this is kind of a tough part of the journey. I think that you will be quite surprised with the part that we're reading now. But most of this is taking place in Idaho. Here is Captain Lewis's journal entry for August the 17th, 1805. I slept very little last night worrying about what I will do if Captain Clark does not arrive today. What could be keeping him? Any number of things, I realize. It is so frustrating to wait here, knowing that with each passing minute, the Shoshones may bolt like frightened deer. They have been raided so many times in recent years, they trust no one. I cannot blame them. According to Kamiya Waite, their numbers have been greatly reduced from disease and starvation as well as war. They have been left with barely enough men of fighting age to defend themselves. I sent Drewyard down river with an Indian, hoping he can intercept Captain Clark and hurry him along. And um, I started to realize uh, that not all these words were Captain Lewis's and the dog's point of view. There's also um, a couple of men who are reading the journal, and this is what they have to say. There's ink spilled over this page, Coulter says. Pass me that canteen. Drilliard hands it over. And then now we're at Seaman's um, words. Captain Lewis spilled the ink when the brave who had accompanied Drilliard came running into camp, yelling that there were white men in boats coming up river. Captain Lewis jumped to his feet. He didn't notice that the ink he spilled, he didn't notice the ink he spilled because Chief Cameo Wade had him in a bear hug. Though Captain Lewis hadn't understood the Braves' words, he understood Camia Waite's enthusiasm, and it was hard to say which of them was more excited. Captain Lewis could now get horses and perhaps get through the mountains before winter set in. But Camia Waite had even more at stake. The arrival of Captain Clark meant he had not led his people into an ambush. A few minutes later, Captain Clark, Charbonneau, Bird Woman, and Drouillard walked into camp ahead of the men in the canoes. The Shoshones swarmed to Captain Clark. When Chief Camia Waite finished hugging him, the chief tied a bunch of seashells in Captain Clark's hair. Then Captain Lewis was finally able to cut through the crowd and reach his friend. The two men embraced and there were tears in the eyes of both. I stood off to the side to save my paws from getting tromped on. Bird Woman saw me and reached into her pouch for a dead mouse which I swallowed in one gulp. She hunched down and turned so I could see Pomp. He seemed to have grown a great deal during our short separation. Bird Woman was going to have to make a bigger cradle board to accommodate him soon. He grinned and laughed and I gave him a wet lick across his brown face. I was about to give another for good measure when Bird Woman squealed in delight, running toward a young Shoshone woman about her age. The woman hugged and cried and laughed and cried and chattered in rapid Shoshone. I was able to understand enough of their conversation to learn that this was Bird Woman's friend, Jumping Fish, the girl who had gotten away the day Bird Woman was captured by the Hidatsas. The other Shoshones were too busy with Captain Clark to notice this reunion. Jumping Fish led Bird Woman away from the crowd. They took Pomp out of the cradle board and while they talked, I played with him. I was surprised at how much I had missed him. I let him pull my fur and crawl around after me. As we were playing, Charbonneau walked up and told Bird Woman that he had been looking for her. We're ready to parley and we need you to speak Shoshone for us. We will talk when I finish, Bird Woman said to Jumping Fish. Will you watch my son while I am gone? Everyone was already gathered beneath the awning when Bird Woman arrived with Charbonneau. The large circle of men stopped talking as she approached and sat down next to her husband with her head lowered. Captain Lewis explained that the words would flow from him in English to Le, to Le Beach, from Le Beach to Charbonneau in French, from Charbonneau to Bird Woman in Hadatsa, and from Bird Woman to the Chief in Shoshone. 
Bird Woman looked up and saw Cammy awake for the first time. Her eyes got wide and she yelled out, Ah, ah, he, ah, ah, he. She jumped to her feet and rushed toward the chief. The captain stared at her in complete shock. Before they could stop her, she was in Cammy Waite's arms. For the next few minutes, there was a great deal of confusion. Cammy Waite and Bird Woman were hugging and crying, and the other Shoshones were on their feet, jumping up and down as if they were standing on hot coals. What the devil is going on, Mr. Charbonneau? Captain Lewis asked, irritated that the dignity of his parley had been shattered. Well, Charbonneau struggled to explain. Well, it seems, spit it out, man. Chief Cammy Awake is my wife's brother. I thought he had been killed in the Hadatsa raid. Apparently not, Captain Clark said, grinning. And if Cammy Awake had any suspicion about our sincerity, this will certainly put an end to it. Cammy Awake continued hugging his sister. Tears flowed down his face and several of the Shoshones were now crying along with him. After a time, things settled down enough for the parley to begin and they talked until after dark. Every once in a while, Bird Woman would be overwhelmed with emotion and begin weeping, but she managed her part of the translation. Cammy Awake promised to provide the party with as many horses as they needed. He also said that he would lead us to the trail the Indians used to cross the mountains. And here we are back at uh, Lewis's journal, August the 18th, 1805. Captain Clark rode off this morning with 11 men to scout the river and determine if we can ascend it with our canoes. From what we've heard, this now seems doubtful. The rest of the men are in camp with me, making saddles for the horses and preparing for our push over the mountains. Cammy Wade has promised to take us to the mountains, but not over them, as he has not been that way himself and he must head to the buffalo grounds soon to gather meat for the winter. Today is my 31st birthday. I fear I have done little with my life to further the happiness of the human race. I view with regret the hours I have spent in indolence and now wish I had those hours back to spend more wisely. I will endeavor to do better. Coulter shakes his head. Now, isn't that just like the captain? He's led us nearly all the way across the country, covered, discovered dozens of new animals and plants, made friends with hundreds of Indians, and in the process, lost only one man. And he thinks he hasn't done anything with his life? It's a puzzlement, all right, Drewyard says, but I guess that's what the way the captain, that Captain Lewis is. What's he have to say next? These are the, those were the words of the two guys that were reading um, Captain Lewis's journal after the journey was over. So now we're back to Captain Lewis's journey, or journal, <laughs> August 29th, 1805. We are ready for the mountains. We have 29 horses and the word of old Toby that he will guide us. The possibility of a Northwest Passage seems to have come to an end with the tremendous mountains we must cross. Captain Clark has returned with the belief that there are no navigable rivers through the mountains. So the primary objective of our journey cannot be fulfilled. This is not a failure on our part, but I am very disappointed considering the hardships we have endured searching for something that does not exist. Surprisingly, the men seem little bothered by this. Even Captain Clark does not seem overly concerned. His only comment was, we have solved a 300 year old mystery. The answer is, there is no Northwest Passage. He laughed heartily as if it were the funniest irony he had ever heard. The only thing that keeps me going and dulls the pain of this disappointment is my concern for the men. I pray the mountains will not take any of them and that there is ample food on the other side. Old Toby is a frail old man and I fear he is not strong enough for a journey such as this. Fortunately, his two sons are with him. And now we go back to Seaman's point of view. Beneath old Toby's loose, wrinkled skin was a core of iron that eventually put all the men to shame. But Captain Lewis was right to worry about our crossing. The trails through the foothills leading to the mountains were steep and slippery. There was little food. Horses fell and tumbled down deep ravines. 
In our first few days, we lost two horses, two horses from exhaustion, and another was crippled and had to be shot. When old Toby's sons left to rejoin the Shoshones to hunt buffalo, Captain Lewis nearly begged them to stay. We cannot, one of them responded through Bird Woman. We must help with the buffalo. You can return as soon as we get to the other side of the mountains. Winter may stop them from returning, old Toby said. What then? We will pay them generously. Old Toby shook his head. My sons and their families cannot eat your gifts. I am too old to hunt. I will not be missed. I will, I will take you over the mountains alone. And back to Captain Lewis's journal. September the 3rd, 1805. Two inches of snow on the ground, sleet falling. Captain Clark shot four pheasants, which we divided among ourselves, along with some corn. Our guide eats virtually nothing. I caught him sharing his portion with my dog. And then the guys who are reading the journal, Coulter shakes his head. That Toby was one tough old cuss. He was at that. And now we have Seaman's point of view. That tough old cuss saved me from starving. A few handfuls of bird guts would not have gotten me far. When we moved from the foothills into the mountains, we met up with a group of Flathead Indians who were on their way to join the Shoshones to hunt buffalo. Their chief was named Three Eagles. We have been watching your tribe for the past several days, he explained in hand talk. He pointed to York. I thought this man was painted with black paint because you were going to war but by the casual way your tribe was riding and the fact that you had a woman and child with you, I knew you were not a raiding party. So I decided to greet you as friends. I'm not sure the captains understood how fortunate we were. Three Eagles had 80 warriors in his camp and could have easily overwhelmed us. Instead, they fed us from their meager supply of food and shared information with the captains about what lay on the west side of the mountains. Captain Lewis tried to trade for food, but Three Eagles people had none to spare. They did have extra horses though, and we'd ended up with several of them by the time the Flatheads proceeded downhill and we proceeded up. That evening, the hunters killed only two small birds, which we made into a stew with corn. Divided between so many, the meal was hardly worth the bother of cooking. Once again, old Toby shared his small portion with me. Each day we encountered steeper terrain, narrower, narrower trails, and dropping temperatures. Food became a distant memory. From Captain Lewis's journal, September the 7th, 1805. Raining, cold. September the 9th, 1805. Arrived at a stream we are calling Traveler's Rest because that is what we intend to do. Drulliard killed a deer and another man, an elk, September the 10th, 1805. Sent the men out hunting, snow on the ground, very cold. Coulter looks at Mountain Dog and grins. This was about the time I first laid eyes on you, Mountain Dog, he signs. Of course, you were a boy then. You filled out a mite over the years, Mountain Dog smiles back. I ran away from you, he signs, like a jackrabbit. I was with Coulter. We were hunting, but most of the animals had moved down to the plains for the winter, so we were not having any luck. Can you tell now that those are words, the ones I just read from the guys who are reading the journal? And now we go to Seaman's words. I saw White Feather flying through the trees, and I barked at him. Coulter got excited. What is it? You onto something, see? Let's go get it, boy. White Feather led us up a steep hill. Halfway to the top, I picked up human scent. Not fresh, but not too old either. Coulter sensed my interest. You're on to it now, see, he said breathlessly. Let's get that cuss. I hurried ahead. On top of the ridge was a pile of huge round boulders. Sitting cross-legged on the highest boulder was a young boy, maybe 14 or 15 years old. And except for the buffalo robe under his bottom, he was stark naked. The wind was howling up on that ridge, snow blowing everywhere, but that boy looked as cozy as a pup suckling his mother. He had his eyes closed and was quietly singing something in a tongue I had never heard. White Feather was standing right in front of him. 
I sat below the boulder looking up at them, somehow knowing I had stumbled across something I wasn't supposed to disturb. Coulter slipped on an icy spot just as he toppled the ridge and let out a yell. The boy's head snapped up and his eyes locked on mine for a second or two, and he smiled. But the smile disappeared when he saw Coulter coming up behind me. What the devil, Coulter said, I'll be a... The boy in the robe were up and gone before Coulter could describe what he would be. We searched for a good hour, but other than the boy's footprints in the snow, we could find neither hide nor hair of him. The boy was not the only Indian we saw that day. On our way back, we came across three mounted Indians who seemed even less pleased to see us than the boy had been. Their faces were as taut as their bowstrings. All three of them were pointed right at Coulter's heart. Flatheads, Coulter said, but I could tell they were from a different tribe altogether. Now don't get riled, Coulter said, and gave them his most charming grin, which absolutely had no effect on them. Their forearms began to tremble from the strain of the loaded bows. Coulter laid his rifle on the ground. The Indians relaxed their, relaxed their pull, but kept their arrows notched. With very poor hand talk, Coulter attempted to explain who he was and what he was doing on the mountain. The Indians didn't catch all of his meaning, but they understood enough to agree to follow us back to Traveler's Rest. The captain smoked the pipe with the Indians and learned they were from the Nez Pierce tribe, or the Nimipu, as they called themselves, meaning the people. The Nez Pierce explained to the captains they were after a band of Shoshones who had stolen 23 of their best horses from their village on the west side of the mountain. Captain Lewis fed them, then asked if they would lead us to their village. He was still doubtful that old Toby was up to the task. The Nez Perce braves discussed the possibility among themselves, then signed to Druilliard that they had to pursue the thieves who stole their horses, and they could not delay. Sorry, Captain Dru Druilliard said. We have to convince at least one of them to take us over, Drulliard. I don't think that old Toby is up to the task. Ask them again. Tell them we'll give them gifts when we reach their land safely. Drulliard tried again. Finally, one of the braves said he would guide us, but he seemed to agree more out of politeness than desire. September the 11th, 1805. No meat taken today. The Nez Pierce, who agreed yesterday to guide us over the mountains, was gone this morning, and he has not returned. So we are still relying on old Toby to take us across. This now is Seaman's words. I was not surprised the brave had a change of heart. After his friends left, he sat around camp looking forlorn and confused. I saw him get up in the middle of the night, load his horse and leave, making no more noise than a mouse walking on damp moss. I let out a couple of barks when he left, but the men were too cold to crawl out from beneath their blankets and look. The next day, the most difficult part of, of our journey began. The hills were covered with downed trees, snow, and slick ice. I was as cold as I had ever been in my life. The frigid air burned my eyes, the ice froze on my muzzle, and the snow balled up between my toes, making each step a painful ordeal. As cold and miserable as I was, it was nothing compared to what the men endured. Swathed in blankets and furs, they plodded ahead in hungry silence, knowing if they stopped moving, the cold would consume them. On the narrower ledges, the men had to get off and lead their terrified mounts across, but the horses still slipped and fell, sometimes all the way to the bottom of the hill. Wearily, the men followed the horses down, picking up spilled gear on the way, catching and repacking the animals, then starting back up again from where they had started. The delays caused the party to string out along the trail for miles. Some of the men didn't arrive at camp until way, well after dark when they found the men who had gotten there earlier fast asleep. September the 13th, 1805. A few of our horses strayed this morning, causing further delays. Four grouse and one poor deer for dinner camped at, the hot, at a hot springs. I stayed in front of the fray with old Toby out of range of the men's foul tempers, which were not improved by their empty bellies. We were the first to arrive at the hot springs, which were something I had never seen before. At first I mistook the steam rising in the cold air for smoke and thought the pools were on fire. 
I barked in alarm. Old Toby smiled at my apprehension. Then he took his clothes off and to my surprise sat down in one of the pools with a satisfied sigh. While he bathed, I dug around the old campfires and found some bones to chew. When I had harvested everything I could find, I joined old Toby in the pool. And that's when the first men stumbled into camp and found us. They were too tired to take their clothes off and partake of the soothing water, but a few of them managed the strength to shed their moccasins and soak their swollen feet. September the 14th, 1805. Rain, hail, horses and men very fatigued, killed a colt to eat. September the 15th, 1805. Old Toby got us lost. September the 16th, 1805. Eight inches of snow on the ground, making it very difficult to follow the trail. There's no water up here, so at night we boil snow over the fires. Killed our second colt. And then we're back to Seaman's words. Old Toby only made that one mistake in all our time in the mountains. He hadn't been over the mountains in 10 years, and he got a little confused by the fallen trees and snow on the ground. He didn't discover his mistake until we had gone four miles and then compensated for it by leading us up an incredibly steep tree-strewn hillside to the top of a high ridge with the men grumbling all the way. Looks different now was his only comment when Captain Lewis asked him why he had led us astray. The next afternoon I joined Captain Clark and Coulter as they forged ahead of the main party to find a good campsite and start the fires. As they brushed against the trees on the narrow trail, small icy avalanches tumbled onto their heads and down the necks of their shirts. By the time we found a likely site, both men were nearly frozen. It was a wonder they could get the fire started with their numb hands. We have to get off this mountain, Captain Clark said through chattering teeth. A few hours later, the men began to straggle in, looking as grim and haggard as I had ever seen them. They squatted around the fires in wooden silence, watching steam rise from others, the other, from each other's buckskins. Captain Clark killed the second colt and started the red flesh roasting. The next day and night were much the same. The men grew weaker with every passing hour. The horse's legs trembled from lack of food, from strain and from terror at the dizzying heights along the narrow slippery trails. Several fell, smashing the fragile loads, smashing the fragile loads as they tumbled down the steep embankments. The men killed the last colt. We can't continue like this, Captain Clark said. We'll never make it to the other side. Captain Lewis looked around the camp at the men and nodded. What do you suggest? I don't like to split up, but I think one of us should go ahead with our best hunters. Try to reach the west side where there must be more game or at least Indians we can buy food from. Captain Lewis nodded wearily. I'll stay back. We'll travel light. I'll try to get food back up to you as soon as I can. The captain looked at the men again. You had better, old friend, or we won't need it. So that's the end of our reading for today. I want you to go ahead and make a prediction. What do you think happens with Clark's party? What do you think happens with Lewis par Lewis's party that hang back? And I kind of think we had a vocabulary word in this reading today, but I forgot to point it out. So I am just gonna pull out the first packet and there is a vocabulary word on page, there's actually two, one on page 199, the word intercept. And I'll see if I can find intercept as I look back on page 199. Yes, it's in um, Lewis's journal. He says, I sent Drulliard downriver with an Indian hoping he can intercept Captain Clark and hurry him along. So I'll say that one more time. I sent Drulliard down river with an Indian, hoping he can intercept Captain Clark and hurry him along. And then there's one more on page 204. The word is indolence. Okay, I remember reading that and thinking, oh, that was a vocabulary word. Here it is. It's also in Captain Lewis's journal entry. Um, today is my 31st birthday. I fear I have done little with my life to further the happiness of the human race. 
I view with regret the hours I have spent in indolence and now wish I had those hours back to spend more wisely. I will endeavor to do better. Let me just read those last few sentences again. I view with regret the hours I have spent in indolence and now wish I had those hours back to spend more wisely. I will endeavor to do better. Okay, good luck with your predictions, your vocabulary, and we'll see, we'll um, catch you on the next reading. Bye.